Hi, everyone. Welcome in. I see some of you have already started welcoming others in the chat. I'm going to allow about one to two more minutes for our come and join. If you are here, please welcome in. Welcome others as well. Let us know where you're from. I see some familiar names here. I see some familiar places as well as unfamiliar places. So welcome in. All right. So we're going to go ahead and get started just because we have a lot to share with you guys. We have a really important discussion this afternoon or this morning, wherever you may be located. But I do want to formally welcome you all to today's webinar hosted by the Accreditation Council for Medical Affairs. For those of you that are joining us for the first time, welcome in. And those of you who have joined us previously, welcome back. Just by way of introduction, my name is Kiana Nixon. I am a pharmacist and the Associate Director of Educational Programs here at the ACMA. All right, so this afternoon, this morning, I will write the discussion of the prior authorization landscape in healthcare. And today, our panelists on this topic are two experienced leaders in the market access and reimburse industry. I am delighted to introduce Matthew Sherman. He is our relationship manager at the ACMA. And we also have Alice Weeby, Director of Market Access and Reimbursement at Intercept Pharmaceuticals. All right. So in order just to give you a bit more of a background on our speakers before we get started, Matt here is a pharmacist by training. And he started his career in postdoctoral clinical management fellowship program as an instructor and a drug information pharmacist with Health Trust and Belmont University. He had previously previously spent over seven years as a pharmacy technician and intern for hospitals and retail pharmacies, but now he's with us in supporting prior authorization and reimbursement team with the ACMA, providing education on the PAX certification program that we'll discuss today. Now, on the other side, we have Ellis. Ellis has been in biopharmaceuticals for over 25 years, the last 10 years specifically in market access. Ellis first started out as a field reimbursement manager at Regeneron, launching three injectable biologics in different disease states before then progressing into leadership specifically for FMs or field reimbursement managers. He then transitioned to Intercept Pharmaceuticals as their South Area Access Director to help build out and to also lead their FRM team. He's worked in other market access leadership roles as well at Intercept, including serving as their Director of Pricing, Market Access Operations, before coming back to an FRM leadership role this spring as now the Director of Market Access and Reimbursement. Welcome, Ellis. Thank you, Matt. We here at the Accreditation Council for Medical Affairs, you have heard us say this plenty of times, have a mission. Right? That's to establish a higher level of global independent standards of excellence right, across the board, across and throughout the pharmaceutical environment. And we do that by having important conversations and discussions through webinars like these right, with industry leaders. Today, you are really all in for a treat in today's webinar model. Matthew will first dive into the workflow and the effects of the prior auth process. And then we will switch into an inter interview style where I will ask Ellis questions on his perspective as a stakeholder in this process. Just by way of management throughout the webinar, this webinar is currently being recorded. So you or others, you all can always come back and refer to this recording for the information we discuss. On the right hand side of your screen, you can also input your questions that you may have for the speakers and we'll be able to spotlight those at the end. OK. And with that, I will go ahead and open the floor to Matthew. Go ahead and begin his background on the prior auth process. Thank you, Kiana. And let me transition to the slides now. All right. Awesome. So. 
Today, we're going to be talking about tackling the challenge. So ultimately, understanding and navigating prior authorization in healthcare. So our objectives today, understanding the workflow of our prior authorization or PA, uh, reviewing some of the potential delays associated with the prior authorization process and the effect of these delays on the landscape. We're also going to, going to be discussing the trends in the healthcare system and how to better navigate prior authorization requests. So what is a prior authorization? Really is a prerequisite of medical necessity for healthcare service, procedure, device, or medication prior to its delivery. Typically, these are for more expensive medications or newer products will typically trigger prior authorizations. This especially is prevalent in the uh, specialty space where you're dealing with a lot of high cost complex medications. Um, and who is involved with this process? Really involves physicians, health plans, medical billing specialists, nurses, pharmacists, PBMs, pharmacy technicians, administrative staff, and many more. There's so many people involved with the prior authorization uh, process. And it really comes down to a prior authorization is all about ensuring safety and cost. If you have a high risk medication, the insurance company wants to make sure that you're receiving the correct dose and the correct medication for that particular disease state for that patient. And you're also thinking about costs as well. If there's a, it, you know, if there's a high cost medication and there's another alternative that's less expensive, uh, the insurance wants to make sure that you've either tried that less expensive option or go with an alternative option that may still, still have the same efficacy, just less uh, expensive. Not mentioned on the screen is field reimbursement managers. They more so are representatives from pharma that help provide providers offices with uh, support and often collaborate with payers uh, to navigate reimbursement issues. Uh, and that'll be more prevalent, uh, you know, in uh, Ellis's segment that will come in the second half when he talks about field reimbursement. So what exactly requires a prior authorization? So typically these high spend uh, newer procedures or medications of brand name drugs that have a generic or cheaper alternative, um, things that are only approved for certain conditions uh, or have serious side effects involved, um, or drugs that are often misused or abused or have potential interactions that with the current uh, medications or complications that a, that a patient may be facing. It also includes cosmetic purposes, or it also be triggered for cosmetic purposes, anything done to do with weight loss, I know is now a very uh, current topic, anything that's like really non-preventative. So just to give you an idea of like what a workflow would be uh, for a prior authorization, this is again, probably the most simplest uh, uh, like representation of the process. But I do, I do wanna highlight this to show you how prior authorizations interact with the landscape. Uh, so whenever a patient goes to a physician, they typically the, the physician will prescribe or uh, whoever's prescribing will prescribe a uh, prescription, which is then transferred to the pharmacy. Prior to the, the patient receiving the medication uh, or, or service, whatever have you, the payer will then run the prescription. And if a prior authorization is requested uh, for, the, for the reasons I, I listed on the slide prior, the pharmacy will then be notified. And then the pharmacy then needs to notify the physician that a prior authorization has been, has been requested by the payer. So then the physician needs to gather whatever forms or documentations is required uh, and send that to the payer to fulfill that prior authorization obligation. Um, you know, this could be labs, diagnosis reasonings, uh, evidence of step therapy, a form of medical necessity. There's a very wide variety as, as to what these clinical documents look like. And then the payer will then uh, either approve or deny. And a decision will typically take anywhere between three to 10 days, but this can vary. That's basically on average. Um, so they have uh, room to approve or deny. If, uh, so if approved, it'll go to the pharmacy and then go to the patient and it would be covered and go to the patient. Uh, if it were to be denied, there's a number of different things that can occur, right? So what they could do is uh, they could uh, try to appeal that process. However, the appeal can take up to around 30 days and there's only about a 2% success rate with appeals. So those can definitely take some time or you can opt for an alternative version uh, or, or alternative medication, which may be better covered uh, or less expensive. Um, or like sometimes the patient will just pay that high out of cost or, or out of pocket cost, um, which again, isn't ideal, but if they really need that medication, they will do so, especially in a timely manner. 
it's very important during this process that the patient is educated and communicated with by typically the pharmacist or the physician uh, to see where the prescription is and where the prior authorization is in this process. Because as it's bouncing back between the physician, between the payer, the pharmacy needs to also be notified when the when they can rerun the prescription and ultimately get that approved or alternative medication to the patient. So talking about some of the delays, right? So I already kind of touched on a couple, but I do want to highlight a few others. So ultimately communication is so key, uh, you know, not only with the patient and being able to communicate with them and educate them as to why their medication is, is you know, being delayed into getting to them. Uh, you also need to communicate to these stakeholders amongst themselves. So, you know, the payer needs to communicate with the pharmacy, the pharmacy needs to communicate with, uh, with the provider, and everyone needs to, to be in sync to ultimately get this patient their medication. And a lot of these prior authorizations also require, or also have various requirements and timing associated with them. So different insurances will require different forms of this documentation, and there'll be different timing associated with how long this decision or appeal process may take. Uh, prior authorizations also last for about a year. So if a patient were to be taking a certain product for about a year's time and the prior authorization expires, they will have to then uh, resubmit for another prior authorization, which could uh, end up, which could ultimately cause like a lapse in care and any sort of medication changes. So if a medication's dose is like increased or if the dosage form is changed, that would also require another prior authorization to be submitted to the insurance company, uh, typically, especially if it's a high spend medication. Uh, also, whenever they are approved, sometimes there's certain pharmacy restrictions. So certain pharmacies at certain locations will be able to uh, uh, give that uh, product to the patient and others will not. Uh, and then also, you know, often we see at the beginning of the year insurance changes. So if a patient's insurance were to change, typically that would also have to trigger and go through the entire product, prior authorization product, uh, process. And then we already spoke kind of on denials, but it's, it certainly can still happen. Um, most of the time, about 80% of the time, a prior authorization is approved. However, it's, it's still that 20% is denied and it takes a long time. Uh, again, that three to 10 days, which can be a big lapse in care, especially with these extremely important medications. So talking about a little bit more about patient access, it's the most important thing in the world when it comes to the prior authorization pro uh, process. A product really only matters when, when a patient's able to use it. So it's important to keep them in the loop and to ultimately help them receive this access by this communication uh, with all the stakeholders and you know, being able to communicate with them on a regular basis to see where this medication is in the process or prescription is in the process. So, uh, Patient access. So as we move toward a potentially value-based system in, the, uh, in healthcare, it's important to understand the goals of the healthcare system and how it's funded. It's important to understand really all the roadblocks related to patient access to ensure that you're educating the patients properly and giving them all the, like, all the education and all the assistance that they need. And really being a patient advocate is so important in this space. So now I'm gonna show you a couple of statistics associated uh, with prior authorizations. So prior authorizations account for a staggering 93% of care delays. And this is from a 2021 American Medical Association or, or uh, AMA survey. Um, a more recent survey actually said that it's up to about a 94%. So this continues to climb. This number continues to climb. This is an extremely high uh, statistic. And I also want to pair that with saying that only 29% of patients who endure the prior authorization product end up with the originally prescribed product. Only 29% end up receiving the product that they were originally prescribed by the doctor. And 40% abandon the therapy altogether, which can be extremely detrimental to patients who, are, who have chronic uh, conditions or serious uh, conditions that can certainly develop and can lead to hospitalizations or worsening uh, effects. Another survey done by the AMA found that almost half of doctors say that prior authorizations often delay access to extremely necessary care. And a quarter say that prior authorizations have, have actually led to more hospital visits because of the delayed treatment involved. So uh, prior authorizations have also been a huge burden for the uh, administrative uh, sort of uh, you know, viewpoint on doctor's offices as 86% that prior authorization burdens have increased over the past five years. 
which isn't too big of a surprise considering that uh, health costs continue to increase and medication costs have certainly increased over the past five years. So to talk a little bit more about cost, um, you know, it's a very costly step in, in patient access and for stakeholders. So for providers, it costs about $11 per authorization related to labor costs and $12 for payers. So each authorization can take an extreme amount of time, not only amount of time, but very costly as well. And then specialty pharmacy especially takes a lot of brunt of this. There's only about a 50% adherence rate for these extremely important drugs that a lot of them are based on adherence to fully get the benefit for their patients. So it has a, a very wide range of uh, uh, impact on the landscape. And pharma companies have, have felt this as well. Uh, there was a 20 uh, prior authorizations were responsible for $20 billion, uh, you know, as far as like prior authorizations go. And this was a 67% increase from, from the 2020. So this is continues to climb. And right now, auto, uh, at the out of pocket costs are now higher than ever as well for patients, which again is no surprise, uh, seeing as though uh, there's been more and more spending and more and more expensive medications right at the counter. So they're dealing with a lot of higher expenses. So it's important that we understand the prior authorization process and again, be an advocate for them. Overall, if you're looking at, you know, how expensive labor costs are, it's about $32 billion associated with prior authorizations. $32 billion, that's an extreme number. And if you think about how they're, like how these transactions take place, about a third of them are still on over phone or fax, right? And then, you know, about 50% are over web portals such as Cover My Meds. So as you can see, it's a very complex process that's extremely cost, uh, costly for the uh, industry as a whole. And no surprise, prior authorization programs are growing. As we see more and more expensive uh, medications come into play, specialty medications are becoming more and more uh, prevalent. Prior authorization is the highest form of, of utilization management used uh, to use in healthcare spend. So how does it affect the industry as a whole? It, you know, obviously it affects patient a uh, access, which is the number one most important thing, but it also you know, makes pro uh, providers stay away from certain products requiring prior authorizations because of these delays that you know, come into play. It's better to get the, you know, in their mind to get the patient their product or get the help for that particular symptom or condition rather than have this delay or wait um, you know, in time. And healthcare providers not, not do not know how to always handle these denials uh, in a timely manner and to deal with all the requirements that come along from the health plans they need to know how to handle them uh very uh more uh, like uh, more effectively dealing with all these different uh types of requirements and 2400 uh, physicians almost two-thirds waited several days to receive any sort of information for the prior authorization process so it's really important to understand the approval process and that'll ultimately enhance that patient access and minimize potential disruptions. So proper education and training is key. So it's important because you want to keep up with industry standards. You want to streamline access by providing your team with specialized knowledge and enhanced confidence to ultimately increase performance and help your patients receive those medications. What the ACMA has is the prior authorization certified specialist or the PACS program. It's accredited by the International Creditors for Continuing Education and Training. It's the only program focused on prior authorization that is accredited, and it's designed to help everyone involved with the prior authorization process properly navigate reimbursement and, and all these delays associated with prior authorization. So some of the key curriculum areas you're dealing with clinical or excuse me, technical competencies. So that's more so dealing with like the fundamentals of how a prior authorization works. You're dealing with more of the clinical understanding, understanding the supporting documents and resources available throughout the entirety of the process. You're looking at regulatory and compliance. So it's not just your standard compliance training. It really comes from it really comes at it from a reimbursement perspective, uh, really understanding uh, healthcare uh, compliance standards like HIPAA and fraud, but also specific prior authorization skills like upcoding and working uh, within the confines of HICSPICS, CPT and uh, ICD codes. And then uh, the last one there is minimizing denials, which again, it's kind of speaks for itself, but really understanding what payers want and how to process prior authorizations effectively.
So PAX has been implemented in uh, 40 of the top 50 pharma companies. It's, ex uh, it's developed by subject matter experts and is updated quarterly. It's a very interactive and comprehensive program. Uh, to talk about some testimonials, Anil, who is a field reimbursement manager from GSK, saw a lot of benefit, uh, you know, going through this program in, it, uh, in his role and really helped with his communication with physicians and nurses. And he said he found tremendous value in it. And then from uh, more of the, you know, like direct hands on prior authorization side, uh, Jay Shree from BILH, uh, who's a coordinator for prior authorization, said it really sharpened her skills and helped with her day to day tasks. So the benefits of overall having like a robust training program and having the accreditation and really being able to train people properly is, is improve that patient care, which is the, of the utmost importance when it comes to reimbursement and navigating the space. Uh, you, you know, you want to save time and money by managing these work for, uh, workflows uh, properly and promoting that culture of excellence that, that gives your team confidence and your patients confidence as well. And it ultimately pres uh, provides a more clinical and technical uh, capabilities and competencies amongst your team. And then like in conclusion, PAs can be extremely complex and very costly that can re result in significant challenges for patients. There's many potential barriers and I know I've named a couple today, but I'm sure a lot of people on this call uh, can even name even more. I just wanted to go over some of the most prevalent ones. Um, you know, PAs continue to be a leading cause of patient access delays, but education and, and certification and having that robust training is the best method to to really best process these prior authorizations. I know when I was a technician working, you know, especially the retail space for years, one of the most grueling aspects uh, was dealing with the prior authorizations and getting the, you know, the care that, that the patient needed in a timely manner and really educating them and helping them understand what this process is, why it takes so long, and really having them uh, helping communicate with the doctor and the insurance company so that they can ultimately receive their medication. As we move into the second part of our segment, uh, we're gonna have Ellis Weeby come up uh, and, and you know, speak from his you know, perspective on reimbursement, more from the field reimbursement and management side. So I'm really uh, excited to you know, hear from him and I'll bring Kiana and him back up to the stage to go over some of these questions. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. All right, so to our attendees, please feel free to ask your questions on anything that Matthew has covered so far. Now, Matthew has mentioned pharma companies or manufacturers as a stakeholder in this process. And this is where our conversation with Ellis comes in. You know, I'm very interested in your insight for us this afternoon, Ellis, but before we dive in, can you first tell us a little more about your career journey and how you got to where you are today? How did we get here to this, this webinar? Yeah, absolutely. Uh uh, as you stated in your beginning, uh, I've been in bi biopharmaceuticals for over 25 years, but I started in sales and sales training. As I progressed in my career, I saw the increasing impact that prior authorizations were having on delaying patients getting appropriate medication. At the same time, my son was going through serious health issues and was prescribed specially made medications himself. That process allowed me to see the patient perspective on the frustrations associated with treatment delays. And together, the intersection of these two events calls me to pivot my career into market access, first as a field reimbursement manager or an FRM. While I was an FRM at Regeneron, I supported the launch of three injectable biologics before progressing into an FRM leadership role. Four years ago, I came here to Intercept as an area access director to help build out and to lead our FRM team in rare liver disease. I've also spent a year as our director of pricing and market access operations before moving back into an FRM leadership role as a director of market access and reimbursement. Awesome. You know, you mentioned uh, your role as an FRM and now you lead FRM uh, teams. Could you describe your role when you were an FRM compared to now as a leader of those teams? You know, I think it would be very interesting to those in the audience so far from what I've seen in the comments. You know, what is your interaction as an FRM in the payer and the reimbursement landscape? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as an FRM, my role was to educate offices on potential access barriers that could prevent patients from receiving appropriate medication. 
and to troubleshoot when barriers occurred. As an FRM leader, it's now my role to ensure that my team has all of the tools uh, that they need in order to uh, help their offices get past those, uh, those specific barriers. Um, Problem. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, you know, almost every specialty medication that's out there requires a prior authorization. The requirements for approval can differ sometimes dramatically between each payer for the same medication. And when you combine this with the reality that offices prescribe multiple specialty medications at different degrees of regularity, it's easy to see how a prior authorization request can be overwhelming. And so, it's my responsibility now as a leader when my team sees any barriers that other members of my team, uh, my market access team can work on a solution. So in your conversations with these uh, healthcare providers and their staff, you know, what are these barriers or these obstacles that you're seeing that they are facing to ensure that that prior auth request is actually submitted accurately? Uh, you know, Healthcare professionals and their staff face many issues around prior authorizations, but most of them are related to the level of detail that the payer requires for approval. Uh, as I stated, almost every specialty medication requires a prior auth, and those requirements differ sometimes dramatically. Uh, and most offices that prescribe specialty medications uh, prescribe multiple specialty medications. And because of that, it's very easy to get overwhelmed by the specific requirements that each medication is, uh, is, is needed in order to get approval. Right. Yeah, and Matthew also mentioned something on that as well. You know, AMA, they release every year the impact of prior authorizations on HCPs. Like you mentioned, this very tedious process, getting those details correct, you're right, on the first try. This really seems so overwhelming for HCPs and other healthcare providers which when you think about it can also ultimately affect the patient, right? Can you elaborate more on what the impact of prior authorization, what that looks like for the patient? You know, absolutely. A prior authorization dec decision can be life-changing for patients. Often specialty medications are a pathway that allows a patient a better quality of life. Take my son, for example. He was diagnosed at an early age with severe asthma which required multiple hospitalizations and severely reduced his quality of life. It was a specialty medication that allowed him to be a normal teenager, to play soccer, to earn his Eagle Scout. Then a severe Lyme infection caused alopecia. A different specialty medication not only restored his hair, but his confidence. And today he's thriving as an aerospace engineering student. None of that would have been possible without positive prior authorization decisions and the willingness of healthcare professionals and their staff members to fight through the PAs, the appeals, even peer-to-peer -peer discussions to ensure that my son was approved for appropriate therapy. You know, behind every prior authorization, there's a patient like my son who's struggling not just with a disease, but with the approval process. And that's why reducing barriers to appropriate medication is not only my profession, but it's my passion. I will never stop educating offices on appropriate navigating the prior authorization process, nor will the teams that I lead. Awesome. Thank you for your for passion. You know, not everyone in these roles across the life sciences industry has that same passion or the same drive as you do. So those that you interact with, right? You mentioned that you interact with multiple stakeholders, insurance companies and payer organizations, healthcare providers, right? Patients also. And when there are a lot of hands in the pot, it can become quite confusing over time. So what are your thoughts really on the importance of effective communication, right? Collaboration between these parties in that prior off process? Uh, yes, you know, clear communication is essential when submitting a prior authorization. First, having all of the required documentation. This could be clinical notes, labs, et cetera, but having them organized in a way that makes it easy for the payer to find the documentation, 
that can be key to gaining approval and helping a patient achieve a better quality of life. I've seen offices so frustrated with the process that they fax in the patient's entire chart, hoping that the payer will just figure it out. I understand that frustration, but that type of strategy just doesn't work. Additionally, understanding the different ways that a payer will allow the prior authorization to be submitted, including electronic PAs through platforms like Cover My Meds, can significantly expedite an approval. But it's also critical that the provider staff establish appropriate expectations for the patient. This includes discussions on how the medication can be delivered, the fact that the patient should expect phone calls, maybe from a specialty pharmacy, a manufacturer's patient support program, maybe both, along with discussions about any financial assistance that may be available to the patient, depending on their type of coverage. Gotcha. So it sounds like education is key, right? Education by yes. the providers, but also education to patients about prior authorizations and this process itself. When you or your team is explaining the prior auth process to healthcare providers or to patients, you know, what are some of those common misconceptions or those challenges that you encounter that you face? Yeah, um, you know, one common misconception is that the prior authorization process is just too difficult. And that happens when that happens the provider or their staff will just give up on trying to prescribe that product and this usually occurs after a bad prior authorization experience where the required information was not submitted or it was submitted in the wrong format a second misconception is that if the prior authorization is denied that that's the end of the road in reality there are multiple ways to approach a prior authorization denial maybe a resubmission, an internal or an external appeal, or even a peer-to-peer -peer discussion. But both of these misconceptions stem from a lack of understanding on how to navigate the approval process. If a healthcare professional believes a medication best fits a patient's treatment, then it's always worth pursuing. With proper education and certification, such as the PAXIS program, these misconceptions can be addressed and the prior authorization process can be far less intimidating. Yeah, I agree. And we're gonna get into the PACS program next. And you also mentioned, you know, education on the provider side and on the payer side as well, that the, we don't want to undermine the physician's expertise that if they prescribe this medication, there is probably a cost to, right? Now, within your team and your role as an FRM, how do field reimbursement specialists specifically help streamline that process of prior authorizations? How can they reduce delays? Yeah, uh, there's two primary ways that a field reimbursement specialist can help streamline the prior authorization process mm -hmm. and hopefully reduce delays. One of these is proactive, the other is reactive. Proactively, a field reimbursement specialist can educate an office on the specific requirements that are needed for payer approval. This can include things like chart notes, a history of previous medications that the patient has tried and failed, and making sure that they submit current and pertinent labs. But this also includes educating the office on the different ways to submit a prior authorization. It may be through a manufacturer's patient support program or directly to the payer. Also, can the PA be submitted electronically through a platform like Cover My Meds? You know, reactively, a field reimbursement specialist is there to troubleshoot if there's a hiccup in the process. This can be as simple as letting the office know that the prior authorization wasn't received or that an approved prior authorization was submitted to an out-network pharmacy. It may involve educating an office on the next step if they receive a prior authorization denial. A good field reimbursement specialist is tenacious. They're there to educate the office every step of the way until the prior authorization has been approved or all options have been exhausted. I agree. You know, I've met a few FRMs and before understanding the prior off landscape, I didn't understand the full scope of the FRM role um, and understanding what they do, how they are really um, a companion, right? In reaching the end goal, which is 
having a, a patient have service to a medication or service or um, a specific test. Now, you mentioned the PAC certification. I know you are uh, PAC certified, so prior auth certified specialist. Why would you say, or could you tell us why you ended up pursuing that PACS program? Right? What was your experience when you were going through it? Yeah, uh, I've actually been involved with PACS since its inception. I was looking for a program that would level set a field access and reimbursement team on the nuances of the prior authorization process. PACS does this and more. For me, Paxis ensures that our FRM team can leverage all available resources and that they have the knowledge and the understanding needed to compliantly educate our offices so that they can be better advocates for their patients' care. Our team communicates the nuances of payer criteria, the level of detail needed for a successful prior authorization, and the options that are available if a prior authorization is denied better after completing PACSIS. Now, this may have answered my next question. You let me know. But is this, you know, in your opinion, what benefits would a team of reimbursement professionals gain, right, from becoming PAC certified? Well, I'll speak to my own experience. Uh, I'm proud that Intercept's FRM team is fully PACSIS certified. It's my belief as a field access and reimbursement leader that having your entire team completing PACSIS raises the bar on the level of education that's provided to healthcare professionals and their staff. PACSIS certification gives added credibility to our team when they're working with their accounts. And it allows me as a leader to focus my coaching on the finer points related to our product and to move my team from good to great. I love this. And, you know, you mentioned again, patients, they often face these care delays, financial burdens, and just pure confusion related to prior authorizations and insurance coverage. And in your opinion, if an entire team of reimbursement professionals do impact certified, how might the training help with patient access? How does that help with patient understanding? Uh, a lot. Um, I'm going to go back to my experience as the parent of a patient dealing with the complexities and delays commonly associated with the prior authorization process. Having a team of prior authorization professionals who are PACSIS certified would lead to offices being more confident in gaining approval for essential medications and being more confident in explaining the process to the patient, including options that may lessen financial burdens. It would give patients like my son more confidence that they will get access to their needed medication, to not give up, and to not settle for a less effective therapy. Uh, this tenacity that you have is what we need across the board. Right? We mentioned all of those stakeholders involved, reimbursement professionals, providers, medical assistants, nurses, the patient, payers, PBMs, right? This tenacity is what we need across the board. And that's the only way, if you think about it, how we will streamline this process. Yeah, and it now, does. It involves all parties. It absolutely involves our, all parties working together, uh, aligned with the patient's best interest in mind. I agree. Now, Matthew, that concludes my questions that I have for Ellis specifically. We talked a lot about the education of multiple providers or stakeholders that's within this process. Um, and I know we have a few questions in the chat. I wanted to see if you want to address these. Sure, yeah. First and foremost, uh, you know, a lot of folks in the chat uh, would like to hear more information or know more information about uh, just medications. We focus on medications because that's the area that, uh, you know, me being a pharmacist and like Ellis, you know, primarily focus on. But I, I don't want to limit that, you know, discussion to understand that our PACS program also does cover um, service line, uh, you know, prior authorizations, uh, radiology uh, therapies, especially, uh, you know, services, infusion services, um, you know, parental uh, nutrition, which is big as well. So it, it, it isn't just a, you know, course based on medications. I, I didn't want to say that that was, you know, the case. Um, I know that, you know, and th thank you for everyone for bringing that up. Um, but yeah, I, I know, especially when it comes to surgery, having a, you know, pre a PA and, pro and process and being approved prior to a surgery 
uh, you know, is extremely difficult. Um, I haven't had too much first first line experience with it myself. Um, but uh, but understanding that better can be achieved through proper training uh, through, through our PACS program as well. A um, couple of questions that I kind of did want to talk about. Uh, let's see here. There's one about, let's see, does the PACS program cover buy and bill uh, for injectable and infused drugs, coding and, and billing information? Absolutely. Uh, that's a really good question. We do cover buy and bill for injectables because I know that can be extremely complicated. Uh, we deal with all the billing codes, you know, J codes, ICD-10, CPT. Um, that is all covered within uh, the modules. Uh, let's see. Uh, Ellis, you want to talk a little bit about portals. There's been some uh, questions and like comments about portals and hub services. Do you want to make any comments or uh, kind of mention more about your experiences with those? Yeah, what I would say is is that for my team, and I think for most uh, FRM teams, uh, we're very agnostic. Uh, most companies allow you to either submit through a, a portal, a patient service program, sometimes called a hub, or go directly to a specialty pharmacy. Uh, for us as an FRM or an FRM team, we're there to support a patient, whether support an office, whether the patient goes through a company's manufacturer's patient support program or directly through a specialty pharmacy. There is an important distinction and that uh, comes around HIPAA. Typically, if a patient is submitted through a manufacturer's patient support program, that patient has given uh, HIPAA clearance to allow the manufacturer and the manufacturer's representative, such as an FRM, to assist on their behalf and to see the patient's PHI. If an office submits a patient directly to a specialty pharmacy, the FRM is somewhat limited. They can still make sure that the office understands the general rules of the road, what is required uh, to get a particular product approved, but they can't get into the weeds on a particular case and troubleshoot a particular case as they could if a case has been submitted through a manufacturer's patient support program. Thank you for that perspective. Yeah, that, that's you know really important to think about as well when it comes to that uh, third party support. Um, <clears throat> but they can be very helpful in cutting down administrative time for sure. There's no, there's no question about that. Um, one of the comments that I, I really did enjoy as well was prior authorization is general is dealing like with a moving target. I've been doing this a long time and it isn't getting better or easier. Thank you, Nicole, for, for mentioning that. I mean, it's certainly as we can, you know, as we saw, it's not going anywhere. I think uh, it's becoming only worse, honestly, as far as, you know, what's being required, uh, especially with more biologics and biosimilars uh, entering the landscape and becoming more prevalent uh, within community farms or within specialty pharmacies. Uh, one thing that, you know, specialty pharmacies also deal with is, is you know, shortages. I uh, did want to mention that, uh, you know, especially with growth hormone, for example, uh, having to constantly submit new PAs for growth, uh, various growth hormones uh, that are on shortage can, cer can certainly even delay further timing and administration to the payment or to, uh, to the patient and receiving that payment, uh, you know, certainly takes a lot of time. So uh, uh, I can only see this landscape getting a lot more complex. And that's kind of, kind of why we wanted to do this webinar today, to really give, uh, you know, some perspective on the current, uh, you know, landscape right now and, and where we're headed. Because right now it's a very costly and very complex process that, uh, you know, really does involve so many different uh, professionals. Um, let me see. And let me see another. Uh, Alice, do you want to comment on, like, uh, discount codes or you know what people will use uh, as like a, an alternative uh, if they can't get a prior authorization through do you see yourself having patients use pharma uh, you know whatever it is like pharma uh, payer assistance programs and having some success with those yeah and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll couch this by saying every manufacturer approaches this differently right um, and every manufacturer sets different guidelines in terms of who's eligible for uh, uh, patient support programs. Uh, but typically, no matter what type of coverage you have, or if you have no coverage, uh, 
there all are alternatives available. For commercial patients, there's typically copay assistance available. Uh, for Medicare patients, uh, for many uh, disease states, there are foundations that offer independent financial assistance to those patients. And for patients who have no insurance or are deemed un underinsured, uh, many times manufacturers will offer free drug programs to those patients. But I, I, I will couch that by saying that every manufacturer sets different guidelines around those types of programs. Okay. Yeah, as we, you know, yeah, 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 thank you for that. You know, thinking about really taking it on from a holistic perspective. I mean, again, it all comes down to patient access, right? And if, you know, that program is, is able to help with that, you know, then that's the route that absolutely, um, you know, should be should be approached. Um, as we near towards the end of the time, we've been going for 45 minutes uh, today. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to address, Ellis, or kind of bring to everyone's attention prior to, to closing down the webinar for today? Yeah, I just had one that I noticed in, in, in the question about uh, somebody had asked, do you think EPAs are helping electronic Oh, great. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I didn't even see that. Yes. Great question. And I will tell you in our experience, uh, electronic EAs uh, help shorten the time frame significantly versus the old system of sending it in via fax. Uh, if a if if a payer allows that medication uh, PA to be submitted electronically, uh, not only do you get a decision back quickly, you'll also understand if you've forgotten to submit in uh, specific documentation that's required. So right. uh, I am a big fan of electronic PAs and I know that my team talks to their customers on a regular basis about mm -hmm. electronic PA options. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to say most people have been moving towards the electronic piece, but, you know, as I mentioned prior, like a lot of uh, faxing is still happening, a lot of phone calls. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's going to take some time to really get everyone, everyone on board, um, you know, and I do kind of want to mention that we do have a new uh, AI enabled solution as well at the ACMA that focuses on reimbursement. Uh, it's built on the largest compendium of reimbursement and prior authorization data, just to kind of highlight some of the technological advances that we also are, are, are getting in that space as well. Um, I believe that's, that's most of all the time that we have for our webinar today. I feel like it was a really, really great conversation and, Ellis, I loved hearing from you. Uh, I think you have a fantastic, um, a really fantastic, uh, perspe you know, perspective because you know you you really got to see the, the uh, landscape as at you know FRM and now more into like a leadership role to, to really give a fantastic sort of uh, you know knowledge base uh, on on how this works and, and your role. So thank you so much for joining today, and you know Kiana, thank you so much for. For moderating i really appreciate you guys and uh thank you for for uh you know being here today uh, to all of our audience as well thank you so much yes thank you for having me thank you yes and if anyone's interested in the pax program uh please visit us at our website at uh you know metafairspecialist.org uh and we can uh you know answer any questions that you may have about Hacks program. We can talk to you about our uh, AI enabled solution. Um, this is something that is very important to us. And if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn or email. Thank you so much for joining today and have a great rest of your day.